Okay, welcome everybody. Um, we continue with our programming. Uh, yesterday, Priscilla Kennedy uh, set up her exhibition, and today we will go through, um, we will experience it with her. And she will make a short presentation now, after which we will follow her to the archive room where the um, the objects and her works are and so priscilla kennedy holds a bachelor of fine arts degree from the kwame Nkrumah university of science and technology notably she won the esteemed first merit award in the barclays latelier art competition in south africa and was honored as the recipient of the 2022 yas Art prize with a multidisciplinary approach, Priscilla Kennedy intricately weaves connections between body, race, sexuality, and fictional histories of objects with hybrid life forms. Her artistic practice encompasses diverse media, such as painting, tapestry, and light. These result in a ten tentacular deconstruction of the female body, including her own as a multi-site for engaging conversation. Over to you, Priscilla. Please, let's give her a round of applause. Good afternoon, everybody. And thanks for coming around. Um, so IUB has done um, the intro and I would quickly take you through my slides. Um, so, so um, the interest or the very recurring thing in my practice or something that I find very um, consuming and also repelling at the same time is the human body. I find it interesting how it's able to kind of have this fluid ability of existing in multiplicities. And that is what <coughs> actually gears my thinking. And so, like IEB had already said, my practice weaves connection between the body, sexuality, and the fictional histories of materials and objects with life forms. And the current life form that is very vivid in my practice now is the octopus. Um, so as the conversation gears down, I would open up that more a bit. And so my approach uh, ranges from um, collaging and working with um, fabrics, textiles, from making um, marker drawings to working with lights and making projections. And my thinking of the body actually started from a point where I used to think about it as a fragile shell, a container. Um, and as my journey evolves, my thinking has actually become um, more open and to thinking about it from a static container or as a unitary organism or as an enclosed organism into something that is more fluid and that can contain and can also change based on experiences and encounters. And so as I think about my body, I actually think about a foreign material or an object that has a very intimate relationship with my body. And in that regard, the next material or an object that becomes very vivid in my thinking was the waist bead. Um, in this part of the world, it's something that women are used to and wear often. And so as I thought about that object that has this intimate relationship with my body, um, I begin to now um, kind of adopt the waist bead as part of my image construction in the representation of the body. And so, yeah, the waist bead becomes part of the image construction, not something to just contribute to the visual rendition of it. But as I think about my body and that foreign object that has this intimate relationship with my body, then it becomes an important aspect of my image construction. Um, I also have this really strong connection with textiles, and it's something that actually evolved from a conversation I had with my mom. 
So my mother had this really interesting way of documenting her motherhood. And anytime she would have a child, she would just buy a piece of cloth to kind of mark that date of birth. And I felt like, interestingly, she was able to kind of collect data on time with just fabrics. And anytime she would see a fabric, she's able to tell which particular year or connect it to a particular child that she had had. I, from that conversation, my interest in fabrics had now evolved from their fancy surfaces to deeper meanings of it into kind of thinking about how these houses, different timelines. And so her wardrobe had become like um, a museum or like a space, is that, a space that houses different timelines ranging from me and my other siblings. And from there, my, my interest in fabrics had grown. I had now begun to see them as, as spaces where other women have been. And visiting our local markets, our local markets have different sizes for different people. They have like the six yards for men and sometimes just two yards for women. So I started getting interested in that sizes that makes that demarcation for women. And so in my narrative, you see that the female body is also repetitive. Um, this is also because my interest and my interest in the human body also starts from a very intimate perspective that if I begin to question something, it should come from a place where I can relate with. And so then the female body becomes a repetitive motive in my image construction or in the narratives. Yes, so this is how um, my mom would place a piece of fabric in behind or as a backdrop to a baby that she had had and literally connecting that fabric to the baby. I also find interest in that um, mere quantification of the body or of me to just a simple fabric and how she's able to use those fabrics to represent each of us. Yeah. So as this image has this fabric that represents my sister, Sarafina, there is also a documentation behind the picture that gives you vivid dates. Yeah. In that regard, I believe in the idea of a common vocabulary in the use of familiar objects like fabrics and the beads I already spoke about. And I feel like they also house remnants of us. They collect data on us and they reflect us, those data back to us. Um, so my thinking about the body has now become more of like seeing it as a site that is undefinable, but also gains a certain kind of um, definition based on certain experiences that either happen momentarily or even within a period of time. And so our experiences of ourselves are kind of linked and connected to sites and experiences and people and things. And so I make these expansive connections of the body using data and historical connections and present experiences, mixing them with life forms. Um, still thinking about our experiences of the body, I, I still thinking about our experiences of the body. I do not me, um, move out of its tangibility just alone. I also connect to the fact that when we go to sleep, there is a certain sense of tangibility that is that begins to play. And so my work or my image construction takes into consideration a certain encounter of something that could be almost anything. Because when we dream, we, we have this um, space where we can almost encounter anything at all. Yes. So these expansive connections of the body considers using data, historical maps, and present experiences. And these maps are literally routes that I document as I even collect my materials from the market. Um, in collection of the beads and fabrics and threads, I document all these movements. And because if I'm thinking about the body in expansive of the data that it collects even by moving around, all these routes become very important to my artistic practice. And I collect these through a Waze app on my phone. And so anytime I travel to the market, I keep, um, data, I keep data on all these movements as I collect the fabrics, the beads, and these markings become part, they are coded, but become part of my image construction, which further complicates the bodies. And yeah, so I mentioned the octopus as a muse. 
in my thinking of of the body and how these images that appears in my narratives are chimeric i consider heavily the traits of the octopus um, as a really interesting organism that has um, a lot of <laughs> yeah interesting traits yes so i learned about the octopus and there is some trait about the octopus that moves in, it into more of like an artificial artificial intelligent organism. Um, so there is something about the octopus, especially when it comes to its, um, it has specialized cells that um, allows it to change its color momentarily based on certain experiences, like how I'm thinking about the body. And these cells are called the chromatophores and it's a, it allows the octopus to change its color when it's, um, it's in an environment and this kind of transition is what the octopus uses to protect itself from predators um, it also has this papillae that allows it to change its skin texture and recently scientists have engineered a certain synthetic skin that is able like is programmed to print 3ds and i feel like even scientists also borrow from the octopus that idea of shape shifting and kind of um, changing its appearance to be able to adapt to species and even protect itself and so there is a certain advanced um, trait of the octopus that is able i liken to what the human experience is now with regards to technology and our experience to our experiences in the world and so then the I, the octopus now becomes that um, life form that I used to hybridize the bodies in my narrative um, and this hybridization is done through different processes um, through direct beading, tambour beading and the um, use of other textile fabrics, the sequence fabric and then beads. Um, so there's an important part of my, pro my processes um, happening um, before everything begins. Um, in pre-production, there are important questions that actually um, kind of intervene or cause a certain sense of um, direction in how the models that I'm um, working with um, represent themselves. So I work with these ladies um, that call themselves models, but for me here, they are collaborators. And some of the questions that happens before production, which is very important to the making, is um, we question these ladies um, in a way that makes them move, that moves their thinking out of their humanness. And these questions is what kind of um, controls their process for the making of the work. And the question, some of the questions, are if you are not a human and you happen to be like an octopus or an, like or any other organism, how would you kind of um, move your body in that regard? And in that thinking, they are able to morph and change themselves or kind of distort their whole being to mimic that um, command given. And that process is a very vital part of, of, of the making of the work because then these models are, begin, are beginning to think in a way we want them to think to. They are adapting to something and information that has been given to them. From the... Um, photos that emerge out of these um, poses. These are now projected onto the velvet materials and then cut out, um, further distorted into the making of the works. And so there is this process in my making, in the making of the pieces that I call the surgical collaging. Also thinking about the experience of the human body as of now, something violent is really happening when it comes to surgery. And so it's a very conscious effort to kind of further distort the images that are taken from the photo shoots, cut them and rearrange them again. Um, and that surgical collaging happens in two parts of the work. Um, it happens as the images are cut and rejoined again to form a figure and also as part of um, bringing other aspects of the work together as in the beading that happens on the tambour trestle the direct beading is also another way of surgically bringing all these parts of the human body in the narrative together
So all the interventions that happened during pre-production, trying to distort their bodies to give off certain postures, is also again distorted when the construction is happening on the fabrics. Um, these distortions are also now brought together um, in, in a way that moves outside our thinking of a complete body. And so the moment you begin to encounter the work, you see maybe a full body, but then there are missing body parts joining in other areas of it. And the next process that happens is the embroidery. But before the embroidery, um, images of the works are taken again um, with the phone and then there is an app that allows me to select colors for the embroidery so it's also the idea of knitting and and layering different spaces together from the mundane onto the phone and trying to work with colors and even taking them back again to the machine to work again on them and the machine that does the embroidery is the Corneli embroidery it does like direct chain stitches and The tambour beading um, is also a type of embroidery that features beads. And so for the tambour embroidery to happen, images are transferred from tracing paper onto the trestle where the beading begins and then also um, cut out from the sequence fabrics to... Just a minute, please. So after the um, tambour beading is done, it takes an outline of the drawing and is filled with the sequence fabric. And the sequence fabric also has this effect that allows you to um, change how it looks. And so for me, it was also an, um, a way of making the work change how they are presented. And any time it's encountered, any like the um, viewer could actually change how it looks still thinking about our experiences of the body and how um, it changes momentarily or even during um, a time period. So this is where the projections of the maps um, or the routes that carries me to the market place to collect beads, to collect fabrics um, are done. Sometimes these projections are done and directly I hand stitch through, especially with the routes that I do just by foot. And there are routes that I actually travel on by car. And some of these ones are done with the um, embroidery machine. Yeah, so this is um, a video of how the tambour beading a time-lapse video of the tambour beading, and then also the direct beading. So that is the aspect of like the collaging that I, the surgical collaging that I talk about. Aside these cutouts coming together to form these um, images morphing, and just hybridized images morphing, um, it also now comes together with the tambour beaded patches of the extended part of the octopus and then also a direct beading that actually transitions that tambour beading into the bodies. So in the processes, there's a part of it that I actually assume a certain sense of collaborating with ghost weavers and setting patterns from the fabrics that are actually collected and used for the works. Um, and there are patterns in the fabrics that are picked and deliberately extended into the images um, by hand stitches. And it's also a sense of kind of continuing some of these patterns that have been woven by these weavers um, in a long time because these fabrics have been around for almost a long time. And so I call that like a collaboration with the ghost weavers extending some of their designs into their bodies. And in that regard, I was just thinking about that um, the idea of cloning and making duplicates of something. Um, there's something, it's something that is very reflective of our era now, the idea of cloning, how sometimes celebrities appear at concerts and 
people have rumors going around that, oh, this is not, maybe Kanye, Kanye has been cloned, this is not who appeared. And so that thinking of the body is still extended in the processes and even in the making of it. Um, there are certain decisions that are taken based on a, a certain um, narrative, but it's expressed in the making in a very subtle way. And in um, image construction uh, or in the construction of the work, um, the bodies that appear in the narrative in certain instances are made to exit the frame of the work and it's kind of a certain deliberate um, decision to kind of transition the bodies from a certain past into a certain presence. And as these bodies in a set, um, exit the frame of the fabrics, they also create extended situations by casting shadows on the walls. And as the fabrics move, these extended situations of the shadows begin to create a certain illusion of maybe something like a ghost or um, a body that is present in the space but cannot be seen. It is also like a deliberate decision to use the velvet fabric because of its iridescent nature and that says that it's able to give you a different appearance based on how you encounter it. So as you move in front of the work, it changes how it appears, still thinking about that fluidability of the body. And so all this thinking also kind of controls the decision in material collecting and usage. And please, uh, plays a major role in, in, in how the works appear. I also um, have been experimenting with um, glowing the dark threads, trying to have a different experiences to the work. So um, when the works are encountered in the daytime, it has a very different visual rendition. And also in the night when the lights go off, these um, glowing the dark threads um, kind of illuminate again back the outline of the drawings into the space. And there are deliberate decisions to actually mix the glow in the dark threads with the normal threads so that even in view of the work in a dark space, there are certain missing body parts too again and the work looks totally different in that experience. Um, so this image shows it very clearly. So this is um, the, pre the previous work I showed um, in light. And this is it in the dark space where the glow in the dark threads begin to illuminate. Um, close ups of um, that collaboration with the ghost weavers by mimicking some of the textile designs that are already existing. And these textile designs become part of the bodies that are. Um, cut out from the velvets, they become part of the image construction. And so it makes every work distinct and like different. And each textile, or each fabric contributes its own special design to how the bodies now begin to even appear. And that has this also strong connection with our independent experiences of ourselves. So then each body that appears in each fabric picks a pattern from the fabric and gets its own kind of um, appearance. Yes. So these are some of the close-ups of the direct hand stitches that happens that kind of projects their um, designs from the fabric into the bodies. It's, it's a really like delicate process to bring all these processes together, like 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 surgery, like I'll call it, uh, moving from the cutouts that brings the bodies together in a surgical way, um, into bringing all these beaded patches from the tambour beading, and now coming in together with the direct beading, and then the hand stitches of the routes that I had to work on. Um, all these delicate processes come together to form that representation of the body. Yeah, so this is like a really good image of how the bodies are embroidered to 
um, extend beyond the borders of the fabric. Um, also trying to break that idea of foreground, background um, um, idea of image representation. And then also for me, it's also a certain kind of projection from a certain past into a presence where um, I see this um, archival documents or these fabrics as documents that carry um, information of people. Like I said earlier, I see them as spaces where other women have been. And so for me, it kind of now pushes these bodies from a certain past into a presence where then these things begin to now cast shadows into the spaces where they are harmed. Yeah, so this is how the, ex the, ex the extended situations from the um, works. And before um, the embroidery starts, there is this process where um, I kind of dye interfacing materials with um, dyes and I deliberately mix them with um, inks from an inject printer. It also to combine this idea of having this naturalness to our beings and then also connecting it with something that has this um, strong connection with technology and so it was also a very intimate experiment in the studio see trying to see how these natural dyes react with the inks from the inject printer and so behind or in the side b of the works i i wouldn't say behind because both sides also present different views to the works in the side b of the works you would experience it with the interfacing material with dyes and then also an extended situation of what is happening in the front in the back. These are um, a few close ups of my works. So, for all these to um, happen, most of the um, drawings are transferred from either the trestle onto the velvet either from photographs onto um, materials and all that so they are um, movement of drawings and traces of routes from one point to the other and all these things happening on the tracing paper and so at the end the tracing paper is also becomes part of um, um, the thinking it, it it becomes works on their own so i layer all these tracing papers again um, as I think about the routes and the movement, the idea of time begins to play heavily. And even now, thinking of the body is so much um, attached to time. And so I layer all these drawings again into an empty time frame, and they actually become like a different series on their own. And with all the excess beats that, um, with all the excess beats from the making of the work, they also end up in these um, clock. Um, the empty clocks that become works and they become like a different series or a continuation to the main works. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Priscilla, for this um, presentation. I was wondering, as you mentioned, uh, medium photography um, as a starting point for many of the images. Are you, um, how should we imagine, like, are you staging them? Are they like staged self-portraits? Yes. Yes, so um, I would say they are staged because in pre-production, we actually have questions outlined um, we will have like um, a collaborator who does the um, the shooting of, of these models and it's staged because then they are presented questions to kind of play act to play act and so when these questions are giving out sometimes they give out certain performances and um, work together with the photographer from who takes these pictures from different angles yes and then at the end of the day um, there is we, we, we settle with images that work with the whole narrative um, that we are working with, the concepts behind and everything. Um, it comes to now um, the thinking of the body now begins to 
um, help decide which particular direction or which particular photograph or image best fits what wants to be achieved. And so that is how it's done. Yeah, like continuing on with the, the model collaborators that you mentioned, um, I really liked hearing you talk about how you work with them as a starting point. But I was wondering if you could speak more about why the non-human or having them position themselves away from the human is important to you. Okay, so I mentioned that um, there are certain um, multiplicities to our experiences of ourselves. And I feel like to work with models that are already human, there are certain sense of humanness that is already existing. And so um, as I try to create this hybridized version of, my, um, of the bodies that appears in my narrative, the already existing humanness um, is already playing a role. And so there is this intervention that has to come to um, kind of contribute or either change how they are already being perceived. Yes. Thank you, Priscilla. I was just, um, not just, among many other things, but I love the narrative about your mother and the cloth and seeing the photographs and so on. I mean, it's, it's, it's so unique. And I'm just curious about your, a little bit about your, I'm a lot curious, but I'm going to ask a little question um, about your personal biography. Did your mother do other, uh, for want of a better word, curatorial things? that um that you think consciously and and unconsciously um you know impacted your eventual choices de desires and so on and maybe uh, a sub question in in the family any other biographies that now looking back i'm sure as a child you took a lot of things for granted <laughs> but looking back you can see pathways within the family that have impacted your own journey? Um, yeah, I would say, to the first question, yes, I would say indirectly, yes, my mother has um, contributed to um, my thinking a lot, um, indirectly, because um, there are some conversations that maybe we'll just have, like just for having sake, but indirectly pinpoints or kind of actually brushes my interest and so there are certain things that she would say that would heighten something that I'm already interested in. And so indirectly she did that. And, and also looking up to her as a mother, there are certain things that would come like um, as free flowing because she's something that you would look up to. And so that's like an indirect education that happens almost all the time because she's something, she's someone that you are always in conversation with. And I also find it interesting how to talk about the connection of the fabrics with the bodies. And she's not an artist, but there are some things that you just pick from someone indirectly as a very artistic way of, um, document of documenting her motherhood. And so indirectly, she has kind of contributed to my thinking as an artist. Um, the second question, which I'm forgetting. <laughs> Can you <pay? laughs> Um, yes, I think I think a mother's um, a mother's life is is, is a curatorial journey. And, and yes, maybe indirectly I haven't concentrated on other things, but I feel like day in day out they are giving us information about ourselves, about our thinking, about about the experiences that can literally connect connect back to us. And so yes, she's she's yeah a source of information for me because we talk a lot too. Yes, and even in the works that I am showing us at now, most of the routes that are coming to the narrative um, is actually like us moving from home to the hospital just because of her. 
And so as I'm thinking about the making of the works, I'm also thinking about my mother's body that is actually encountering a certain experience. And so as moving here from the house to the hospital, all these rounds for me, I'm documenting all the, my experiences with my mom. And so these pieces like currently are very dear to me because it kind of emerged from a certain sense of chaos about her body, which I'm still th thinking about. And so, yes, she's indirectly influencing most of the things I'm thinking about as an artist. And yeah, it's really important for me. Yeah. Okay, so then we can go with Priscilla to the archive room. We we look, we see. Can we touch the works? Yes. <laughs> okay. So you can be touched. in these these particular ones, yes. So yes, feel free. In these ones, yes. <laughs> because this is a boy. Mm -hmm. But the is drawn on a layer. Stem quilting. But they have but they have quilting machines and they have Corneli embroidery machines. So if a Corneli embroidery machine does its part of embroidery and a quilting machine does quilting. And uh, an embroidery machine so, mimics so here it will be termed as what? It's embroidery. Embroidery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's quilting. And here yeah. is and here we do then we are on top. Why why is you oh, will define that? Oh yeah, of course we will talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when we are looking at the work, do you scroll down? When I gave you the phone to look at the work. No, no, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't touch it. I just brought it to you just where the image was. Okay. Where well, you've you, looked You would out. have seen the other works I was talking about, the undergraduates. No, I just saw the first image. <laughs> it's a role in how the images are worked. Yeah. And in Accra, working with the gallery, they actually have some conditions around their buildings. And yeah. galleries always have rules. So most of the time I have to kind of mm -hmm. either negotiate or kind of mm -hmm. yeah, agree with the gallery. Yes, based on the spaces that are available. And, and what is your preference? Um, like here to have it in the space because it's kind of funny if people are standing next to the art piece. It's like a, a extension of the body as well. So um, in my first exhibition, most of the works, um, I had some hanging in free space mm -hmm. and I also had some um, projected from the wall. Um, it was also for me to give like um, multiple experiences to the works, mm -hmm. yes. And so, depending on also how the space reacts, mm -hmm. I'm able to kind of maneuver mm -hmm. around it and make it what happen. Yeah. Yes. And as much as it has um, this double perspective to it, um, I feel like some of the works gives you the ability to experience it in that way, mm -hmm. whilst the um, other works that project from the walls also kind of compromise with the architecture to still show themselves and where you're getting the size of the fabric Fabrics. from is it like window size because you're also using the curtains yeah. so i mentioned in the presentation that our local markets have different sizes for different people uh -huh. and with the male fabrics they actually come in six yards but the women fabrics are actually smaller and sometimes they're either two yards or a yard and so I deliberately collect those two years of fabrics that are made for women because of the kind of representation that is happening. And so the kind of the fabric and pieces there. Yes, this, ah. is, this is how they already are. Yes. In this size. Yes. So sorry, because we are getting it on roll. It's more like the. Oh yeah, I see. Yeah. Oh yeah, interesting. Thank you. Did you, did you always work with textile, or did you start uh, with a painting from, uh, practice? I started working with textiles, yes, from the yes, from the beginning. Um, it was more of like weaving synthetic fibers of hair through um, mm -hmm. scarves, and so it was. It has been crafty from the scratch, yes. So yeah, that mm -hmm. has been it, yeah. And as you're 
you tend to go beyond the frame. I was wondering if you also had like a thought about the sculptural practice ever? Um, sculpture. Um, most of the work works that also happen aside these ones transitioning to objects like the one I mentioned um, with the tracing papers. Um, yeah. So I collect um, clocks that I empty out and layer mm -hmm. all these different timelines again inside. And so um, maybe it transitions from tapestry to objects. And mm -hmm. I feel I have this, I feel like I have this um, um, connection to experimenting with different things. I've experimented with light. Um, the glow in the dark threads also give me that connection to light. And so the objects that I, co I collect and work with also leads me to other objects that mm -hmm. they have connections to. And it's such an interesting journey to kind of move mm -hmm. into all these different frames. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> These are the newest pieces that I've not like kind of I recently because your mother won't she remember. <laughs> <laughs> of course she would. Yeah, but they were actually supposed to be pasted around but we didn't want to alter the already existing setup. Yes. Actually, the presentation in this room works very well, as so surrounded by... Yeah, collected <laughs> fabrics and all these archival yeah. fabrics, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like this, here's the potential. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Don't move, I want to see you and nobody else. Oh, okay. <laughs> Somebody else go away then. Somebody's legs are behind, but we'll take it later. I don't You see. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I know famous people. Oh, yeah, it's nice.